Hopefully now. Okay. So we got six attendees. That's all we need. This is a. Uh, this is not going to be uh, on its own. Going to change the world. But let me start off. Um, let me start this session going. This is actually the first one, and this group this Google group that we have at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is actually in the very privileged position. Uh, I don't think this is well known or it's been published extensively enough, but this is the Google Developer Student um, Community Program is actually Google's main funded program for interacting with uh, universities. So it's a kind of portal to lots of different things. And one of those things is machine learning. Another is networking. So if you want to, if you want to be more integrated into the Google uh, ecosystem of developers, uh, community managers, artists, epidemiologists, there are plenty of those. Um, you can let me know and we can try and do something. Um, but let's focus today on machine learning because that is really what you're all here for, all four of you. <laughs> um, but I think many more people are going to see this because I'm going to put it on YouTube and and the School of Hygiene is going to sort of promote it. Um, this, what is this session? It's Explore Machine Learning, which is an official program run by Google to help people understand and get involved with machine learning from nothing, just complete basics. And uh, it's with Google Crowdsource. So Google Crowdsource is the is the subdivision of Google running this program. Google Crowdsource, if you're not aware, and you won't be because it's not that well known, <laughs> um, is a is a, is a uh, platform developed by Google um, to crowdsource machine learning. So if anyone's sort of excited about crowdsourcing, you know you know its its potential power. And of course, machine learning is so much premised upon the upon a uh, multitude of data that uh it's it's very useful to do crowdsourcing have lots of people involved and that's what crowd that's what crowdsource the company subdivision of google does it encourages people to get online help out in machine learning projects be credited for it contribute and understand to machine learning processes which are so often totally esoteric and impossible to understand from the outside and part of that is outreach, which is what we're doing at this very moment. Um, we'll talk about crowdsource more in a minute. We're going to do some fun little games and watch, we'll watch some videos and then we'll do some games. And then we'll kind of dive more deeply into the technical aspects. And then on Friday, assuming anyone turns up, it doesn't matter if they don't. I love a monologue, a soliloquy. <laughs> But we'll do some actual um, computer programming of the machine learning, doing some simple exercises. And, you know, if this were me doing it, if this were me designing the syllabus, this syllabus is completely designed by Google. If it were me designing it, I would just do the coding, like, just the, that would be the only thing I did. You know, just be for two hours, we'd just do exercises, one after another, and then you'd pattern match it and you sort of get your, your, your head around it. Because, you know, the funny thing is, I, I'm, I'm delivering, delivering this lecture, but I do not learn from lectures well at all. <laughs> it's just something I just, I don't learn well from lectures. I learn well from doing. And I think a lot of people who uh, learn computer programming actually discover something about themselves, which is that they've been only exposed to learning by lectures, learning by teachers, and they haven't really been exposed to learning by doing. And then it suddenly clicks and they're like, wow, this is actually what I can do. It's totally the case for me. I was never a great, great, uh, great academic. But as soon as I started to work in computer science, and I've been machine learning for about three years, I've been programming for about 10 years, I suddenly clicked and I was like, wow, this is actually, I can actually do something. <laughs> um, along with demography, of course. So that's that's a good that's a good ramp up to who I am. Um, I'm Gregory McGann. I'm a master student at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, 
and I'm also the lead of the Google Developer Student Club here. I'm the first lead. We just started the club, but it is funded. It is supported. I think if you've been involved already, we've already had some quite successful events. Uh, you'll see that Google is really behind this program because they, as I sold them on the principle that London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is really at the forefront of fighting the pandemic. And there's some ex exceptional research being done. And so they're really invested in this. And I think that's evidenced by the fact that they've not only given us this program, this funded program, this community, but they've also given this, they've also invested in us for this um, machine learning program, which is going to stretch for the whole year from now for an, uh, a whole year. And um, it's going to go really deep, but at the same time, try and involve people at this introductory stage repeatedly. And it's all supported. Yes, it has started. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at the comments as well. I find there is something they told us when we were training because we were all trained by Google ML experts for a long time. And they said, don't look at the comments, just look at the list, just get on with it. I'm breaking from that and look at the comments. But anyway, so I'm the lead of the Google Developer Student Club and I'm also the lead, the lead facilitator for this machine learning program at University of London. Um, in my day job, I work for the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And in that capacity, I've been doing machine learning for about three years. And it's mainly been focused on econometrics, but I've also done some interesting stuff with um, speech and uh, hate speech with UN Department um, of the UN Development Programme. And once you get into this, you'll find that these skills are the transferable skills of the 21st century. I mean, that's something you'll come back to again and again. Once you get, once you've had a basic introduction to this stuff, pretty soon you'll think, wow, I can, I can apply this to pretty much every aspect of my work. And I certainly found that. And by the way, this is what's so special about this, this program at Levin School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, is that it's not computer scientists who are making the running at the moment. It's people who are not computer scientists, but are getting involved and then bringing the, these learnings to their work outside computer science. Those are the people who are making the huge difference, not computer scientists themselves. This is about being a bridge. And in each your own way, I think so many people at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the University of London more broadly can be a bridge to whatever discipline. That could be English literature, or it could be epidemiology. But these skills are so much in demand and quite easy to learn. So let's get on with it. Now we're going to watch this uh, happy clappy video from Oxford's Big Data Institute. And I think this is a, is a, is a pretty fitting introduction to it. And hopefully you'll be able to hear it. When we were doing the training, these videos on Google Slides, <laughs> it was a, it was a bumpy ride, let's say. Um, but hopefully you can hear this. Okay, let's 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 watch this together, and put it in the chat if you can't hear it. I'll start it again, or I'll put it on YouTube or something. Anyway, I'll share you the link anyway. Hi. 
Okay, guys, I know that audio was not brilliant. Um, yeah, maybe, I mean, okay, Gina is suggesting, does muting your microphone work? Uh, is that how it works? You, you mute yourself and then it, and then it somehow goes through? Like the person who designed this software badly told me it doesn't, they don't have the integration. So, so I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it is what it is, but um, I've sent you the link, so uh, you can kind of uh, look at that. Don't worry, most of what we do is not going to involve, is not going to involve that. Watching videos, I know there are two more, so I'll give you the links and you can kind of like follow along if you want, or you can just listen with the bad audio. Okay, um, let's play a game. This is more fun than videos. Uh, um, if you go to this this uh, address, you can download a a video. You can download a a game. You can if you well just download this this app called CrowdSource. Oh whoops, um, and then we'll be able to play this little game. Uh, if you don't have a <coughs> an Android, unfortunately, it's impossible. <laughs> so you can just watch, but um, it only takes about two minutes. So don't worry if you don't. Um, my 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 own Android was actually stolen in Germany. So I myself, I'm playing on like a simulator. But I'll explain it to you anyway. So this is not the most fun game. Um, but if you have it, download it, and you can sort of play along. Um, but when you go onto the app, uh, you'll be able to find this, which is like a way of, uh, identifying objects. It will guess what the object is, and then you can say yes or no. Yeah. So, I mean, this is an example of what we would call, uh, image classification. And... It's probably the simplest form of it, and it's designed to sort of teach you how to do it. Um, uh, and you can use a chat to tell, if, tell us if the camera was able to do your object. Does any, has, any, has anyone been able to do it? We've got like, we've got like nine people. It, <laughs> probably everyone's an iPhone user. Honestly, I am too, so <laughs> I can hardly complain. Um, but you get the idea. <clears throat> okay, so um, let's just discuss this for a little bit. Um, how does the image identification work? If you have any comments on any of these questions, put them in the chat. Uh, yeah, basically it's it's training on a data set. Uh, it's you, yeah, I mean, it's computer vision, I guess. Um, how is it recognizing the objects? It's comparing, I mean, there's a, there's a complex ex explanation for this, which is that it, uh, it looks at, it has, an, it has an idea of space. And this is based on a very ancient idea, well, not ancient, but old idea called Euclidean space. And it tries to sort of uh, break, break up the, the image into let's say pixels, and then compares each, each pixel. Now, the problem with that approach is, historically, that what if you had the exact same object, but it was slightly different in the picture? It would be in a different place. So then, is it, it's, then it will come out as a different thing. So that was one of the reasons that early, early image classification didn't really work, because it was, it was unable to deal with that with that variable as it is, is it was very it was it, it found it very difficult to do and now so we we have a it's those kind of rules-based ones we're going to discuss rules-based machine learning shortly but that was the first initial failure of rules-based machine learning or rules-based artificial intelligence further inquiry how could we program this now this is going to sound like nonsense but um this this this, this is a coding program this is a coding question. And we're gonna get into more of this on Friday if you want. Of course, this will be recorded, so you can kind of 
Um, not we're gonna not go on Friday and still get the answers. Um, it's a way I would approach this is if we if we were coding, and this is a Google this is a Google program, so I should say um, TensorFlow Keras. These are very good machine learning, very good uh, machine learning APIs um, that you can easily access in like five lines of code. You can load an image and you can do a classification. And uh, so I would use the um, image classifier from the Keras API for TensorFlow. But there are lots of different ways we can do this. And I hope over the, over the next like few months, maybe after Christmas, we'll be able to actually kind of explore this. I personally didn't learn from TensorFlow. One thing you shouldn't do is go away from this and be like, I've got to do TensorFlow immediately. I would say the best way to learn is just an aside. I shouldn't do these asides. They told us not to, but as an aside, the best one to learn from is actually um, Scikit-learn, which is not, not a Google program, but it's, for me, it was, the, it was my introduction to machine learning. And that breaks down in a very easy way the steps to doing machine learning because they're very, very definite steps and so what we would do in this in essence all of these ones what they're going to do is they're going to have a training data set and a testing data set and uh, you're going to be able to and then you'll run uh, some some machine learning um, algorithm on your data sets uh, and then you'll evaluate them <clears throat> but we'll get onto that later that was a preview of what's to come. Okay, this is the more fun game. Trust me, this is the one you're going to remember. <laughs> um, quick draw. So here's the link. I don't know why they broke it up like that to make it go down. Um, quick draw. I'm going to just going to quickly. Show you this. This is a more fun one. Okay, let's uh, let's draw something, and we, it's it, it's gonna guess, and then it's gonna tr it's gonna try and do boomerang. Let's let's tr it's we have to try and draw. This is like charades. Is it charades or charades? Anyway, you draw something and it tries to guess it. Okay. Oh yeah, good. Okay, horse. Uh, I don't know what a horse looks like. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, oh my god, no. <laughs> Izzy, that's, this is this is machine learning. It's trying to guess um it's trying to to actually guess from what we're drawing i know it was a great horse wasn't it how did they not get that was a horse oh it's the horse um anyway i think i think i went too much on the jaw that was the problem there uh anyway you guys can try this quick draw with google one of the things we're going to do is we're going to break down the code of this this app in the future so stay tuned because it's actually quite simple coding quite simple programming it's quite entertaining. I mean, you can see why it's simple because it gets it wrong. <laughs> Let's do one more. Uh, what did it say? Okay, I'm gonna try and draw um, a, a syringe. Okay. This looks like it's. Okay. Is that a syringe? Drill. Okay. As you can see, even the mighty Google. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good um, syringe, but yeah, didn't work out. Anyway, you guys have some fun with this because if you want to, we can take this server and we're gonna talk about this in a later session, is how we sort of make this app. It's not, it's not very difficult to do. Okay, have, have, have some fun with that on, on your own. Um, you can get a sense for what we're doing with machine learning. And yeah, that on the back is a is a is a my 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 background is a uh, is a shortcut is is for program is programming shortcuts because I always forget them. That's what my background is. Okay, so we had a little bit of fun with that. 
and call it fun. Um, let's discuss this again, like we did uh, previously uh, with the last game. How does the game work? Uh, very similar. This is the same kind of question. It's computer vision. It's trading on a data set. How is it recognizing your drawings? Same thing. Um, usually with these much more abstract ones, it's useful to use something called a convolutional neural network. And this is, this is one of those things you can kind of say, and it will get you out of trouble in terms of machine learning questions. Um, but um, as a preview, if you want to look into this, um, the, the, well, this again uses Keras TensorFlow, but uh, there's a really good package called um, Torch Sketch, I think. And it's with PyTorch, which is a, if you have, if you have Python, if you can use Python, you can use this library called uh, Torch Sketch. And it basically just, it helps you create this. It helps you process images, which are hand drawn. And um, it's an interesting one and it's quite easy to use. Um, but this is for a later time. This is kind of like um, a preview of what's to come, but just, just, just dwell on this, just dwell on this. Okay, uh, yeah. So now it's kind of use helpfully, helpfully explaining to us what is the, um, why it's doing what it's, why it's doing what it's doing. Um, it has a, it, this is the data set that it has, right? And it, it just basically just processes, it has this enormous, um, database of images and the trick is that the game tells you at the beginning draw boomerang and then so what you try and draw no matter what it is it will it will log as a tag as boomerang so the next time someone draws a horrible boomerang it will say boomerang do you understand it's like if if we were just drawing something and it was trying to guess what it was we'd call that unsupervised machine learning. But because it starts with a tag, boomerang, and then you draw boomerang, you're tagging it to begin with. And that's what's called supervised machine learning. Might not make sense at the moment, but that's one of the key distinctions we're gonna go through theoretically, which is supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Long story short, unsupervised machine learning uh, is is for when you have very little information. You just have unstructured data. You just give it lots and lots of data and it tries to put them in groups. It's quite useful as a, as a initial measure. You don't know what you have. The, un, the, un, the uh, unsupervised machine learning orders it for you. You evaluate what it's done and see if it's kind of in the right ballpark. And then you can use those categories going forward for your later machine learning. So what you might do if, is if, if you're Facebook, in fact, what I did uh, years ago for hate speech was you basically did, we didn't go in with any presumptions of what was hate speech. We, we went in with a load of messages, hundreds and hundreds of words and phrases. It was in the Middle East, but I don't speak Arabic, so it's kind of abstract but, um, in the Middle East. And um, we didn't go in with any presumptions about what is what is hate speech. We just had it the unsupervised machine learning looked at all of the data and it sort of and it grouped it and then from those groups sampling from those groups we were able to see uh, certain patterns which could be quantified and then with that information and those categories we were able to do supervised machine learning do let me know if this is making sense <laughs> um because this is going kind of off topic and um there was actually, a, there is actually a vague script for this, but that was not in the script. But bear that in mind, supervised, unsupervised, important. Okay. Takeaway from this slide is there's a whole lot of tagged data on, in this case, carrots. People are asked to draw carrots. I mean, some of these are just horrible. They are clearly not carrots. I mean, maybe there's a radish or something. <laughs> One of them looks like a knife. But the point is not that they look like carrots. The point is they were tagged as carrots. Understand that distinction you've understood 
half the battle of machine learning. Okay. Now it helpfully explains what I've already spoiled as the outmoded approach to machine learning or to computer um, uh, to artificial intelligence. Sorry. We're going to go through some um, definitions later of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Okay. Everything okay with you guys? I, mean, I haven't heard much on the chat. Let's see. Um, is everyone kind of understanding and audio is okay? And you can see me because this interface is really not giving me much feedback. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Um, quick draw, rule based. Okay, so quick draw is the app. Uh, now we're just looking at what, how it would how it would be programmed if you're going to use rule based stuff. Frame the goal of the product. Designers and engineers develop flow and logic, and then refine until goals are met. So this is quite a simple kind of agile framework. So if you if you're a developer, you're kind of aware that, um, or you're you're using you're using methods which are pioneered by developers, management techniques of iterative design having a, a workflow which uh, continuously improves and deals with its problem solving so this is kind of like what you'd be doing if you were in 1960s doing a um artificial intelligence project you'd be you'd have something you'd say well that hasn't worked we'll make some little change and we'll write out these rules um to determine what is a carrot you know is it orange Here's what orange is. Here's the here's the hex code of orange. Does it match the hex code of orange? And then um, you'd sample the results and see does it has it caught all the carrots? And you just have to hope and pray that you made the right you did the right sampling. <coughs> here's machine learning. Here's the difference. Frame the goal of the product. In this case, it's labeling, as it was previously, as it is with always equipped for quick draw. Train a model using examples, and then refine until goals are met. So let's just look at this. Designers, so the previous one, rule-based, this is, this is the 1960s artificial intelligence. Designers and engineers develop flow and logic. Now we train a model using examples. What's the difference? The difference is basic assumptions. If you're using the method that we just talked about, you don't go in with any assumptions about what a carrot is. You've never seen a carrot. You don't care what a carrot is. A carrot for you is what people have labeled as a carrot. So when the, when the, if you remember when quick draw started, it said draw boom, boomerang. In this case, it draw carrot. You need to draw something. It could look like a dog every time. But if everyone drew something that looked like a dog, that's what the model would make. And you wouldn't care. That's your model. You don't go into those assumptions. And then you can and then you test it. So you build up your model with with your tagged classified data set. And then you test it. So then the genius of quick draw is that it both generates a data set, tests it, it builds a model, sorry tests it and then iterates or refines in this in this vocabulary so it can it's it's you're a, you it, you're able to say did it match or not um okay is everyone following you still got audio visual am i being too digressive about this um Let's try some examples. Because by the way, the rules based approach can still work. I've, 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 I've undersold it here. The rules based approach can still work. Primarily if you just don't have examples and you can't generate them. So this is very small data sets. Alphabetizing a list of song titles. What do you guys think it is? Put it in the chat. Rules based approach or machine learning. Remember, the rules-based approach where an engineer or developer or whoever it is who is a specialist in the subject writes down 
what is what is a carrot? And then we compare. Ashka saying combine both. We've got one vote for both. <laughs> um, in practice, that's going to be right most of the time. But I think they're here. They're sort of choosing. They, they there are some which are both. But okay, it's rules based. I think in this in this case, what they're going with is that there aren't is that the there aren't enough data there, there aren't enough data to inform. Um, oh no! In this case, alphabetizing you wouldn't need machine learning. It can just automatically run that alg algorithm of alphabetizing of alphabetization. Why would you need machine learning? It's already the rule is clear. Implement the rule. I suppose if it was like. If it was, um, uh, if there was some sort of preference involved, can everyone see the? Can everyone see it? Melvin's saying he can't see the presentation. No, I didn't turn it off. Why is it doing this? Okay. Uh. <sighs> Can you see me? I've stopped sharing now. Okay, now we're gonna try and do this again. Okay. Internet connection is unstable. Brilliant. I love Britain. <sighs> okay, um, we're back. Can you see it? It's a cursed country and it's and it's and it's antiquated broadband. <sighs> okay. I can say that because I'm British. Uh, Okay, we're going to move on from alphabetization. So I think the lesson here is, um, if the rules are absolutely watertight and efficiently imp implemented, then you can use rules, rules-based as well. So the two times you use rule-based are not much data and uh, if, it's, if it's watertight, so we had a we had a really we have a really exhaustive definition of carrot. Yeah, exactly. So Melvin's saying, is is there is there a point where there are so many rules that rules based approaches become impractical? Exactly, that is exactly it. So in the nineteen sixties and seventies, artificial intelligence guys were sitting around in Stanford just compiling hundreds and hundreds of rules for computer vision. They were like, if the light is refracting. It's going to look like this, and that was that was one of the reasons why it was so stunted because you just you just couldn't create all the variables, and the computing power wasn't there. Moore's law hadn't taken effect enough. People were like, "We'll just wait it out. We'll just wait until the computing power is strong enough, and then we'll just put in all the rules." And we might want to do that actually. So a lot of the stuff that we do um, in a lot of the AI ethics is actually now kind of saying machine learning is so blind. We actually do need rules because we need to we need to evaluate it, evaluate it against rules. We at least have that option. So if it's if it's com consistently wrongly grouping hate speech, for instance, maybe you want some rules to be like this is this is categorically hate speech. Like we don't we don't want any beating about the bush. This is categorically hate speech, and we don't want we don't want any any kind of. Um, we don't want the crowdsourcing, which is implicit in machine learning. Crowds are dangerous. Madness of crowds. That's a there's a book I'm looking at it on my bookshelf. It's one called Madness of Crowds. Okay, try another one. Rank, ranking web search results. So this is a very Google question. So if you don't know, Google was founded by uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, and with something called the um, 
a page rank algorithm. And essentially, the page rank algorithm is actually quite familiar to those of us who've worked with epidemiological models in the sense that it's a network approach. And um, it's it, it it's it, it's kind of a measure if you if you're familiar with networks and graph analysis probabilistic graph analysis it's a measure of um betweenness so it's like if you have a network how do we see um who is really important in the network not not who is the most connected who is the most um central it's who do you have to go through to get to x so there was an algorithm i've kind of i've just spoiled this now because by saying it's an algorithm like that, of course, I'm kind of saying it's rules based, but it's in fact both because now the, the, the page rank algorithm has been updated to um, incorporate um, preferences from across the internet, how people are actually using it, how people actually so what are, what are people actually clicking on the, on the first page? What do people want to get to? If they, if, they, if they go into a second page, maybe they really, the stuff on the first page really isn't good. Um, and actually, a lot of the approaches to machine learning which are being pioneered now are using um, advanced network or graph algorithms. So this is a ma major growth area of machine learning um, because as we'll discover, networks, specifically neural networks and network databases are essential to understanding um, data. And of course, data is how we train. Train machine learning. So this is this is very much linked to um, the sort of things at the, at the advanced level of machine learning. Looking at chat, oh, Melvin asks, so in a way you can have rules to pre-filter and then apply, yeah. So it it's, it's in practice that it will almost always be a, um, some level of rules so i mean because <coughs> um unless you start from on some of completely start from unsupervised machine learning and a lot of uh, and this is what often they're forced to do in the tech giants because there's so much data they actually can't devise rules there's just such a there's just such a, a super abundance unless you start from completely unsupervised machine learning. So machine learning then is just kind of clumping things together, doesn't know what the hell they are, just clumps them together and then you look at the results. Unless you're doing that, um, you have to start with with some kind of some kind of rules. So if you're doing text analysis, for instance, you will want to have some uh, stop words, which are basically ways of saying kind of like, don't include and or um, uh, uh, other words which are kind of you don't want to search for, you might want to exclude them for some reason. So those are rules that we'll use in natural language processing, which is of course a major area of machine learning. So it's almost always a fusion of rules based on machine learning. But let's, put a, let's humor Google and um, guess, predicting house prices based on location. Being um, a dispossessed, generation to being a dispossessed millennial i of course have little experience with house prices but um <laughs> um what do you guys think rules based on machine learning i really don't know actually i really i don't know how to approach this i think both are legitimate there's no wrong answer come on guys i'm trying to make this in interactive Attica says rules sneakily taking an option to have a drink Yeah, so we got we got basically everyone. We're gonna go for machine learning. I actually don't agree with that. I think I think there are some things which you you'd have to start out with some some rules. But I think because how house house pricing is there are so many variables, you might have to. There's first of all there's a lot of variables, and second. Um, there's such a huge amount of data available. I think you could get away with machine learning. I personally would would start off with rules and then go to machine learning. And also because of the legal aspect. Machine learning is very bad at law. It's very, very bad at law because law is, is, of course, rules-based. 
So if you, you have to apply some legal filters to this sort of thing. Does this person qualify for a mortgage? Do these people qualify for mortgage, etc.? So I think both, but they've said machine learning. Let's actually see the commentary on this. They do give me the answers, so I have to. Um, yeah, so what they say is, this is from Google itself, there's no perfect formula determining how much your home would cost. Okay, fair enough. There are other factors that could play a part in how much your home price costs. So they're just saying the waters are so muddy. They didn't mention the superabundance of data, which I think is really important. Well, I have to agree to disagree on this one. <laughs> Processing online payments. So this is a huge one. Of course, giants like Elon Musk started with PayPal and the implicit machine learning of, of that. Um, and now you have things like um, Stripe. I don't know if any, any of you guys are aware of Stripe, which is a huge startup. It's, I think it's the most valuable private company in America. At the moment, it was started by two Irish brothers who moved to, moved to America and started this online payments company. And now I think it's now worth like 98 billion. And they famously use machine learning for online payments. And what do we feel? What do we feel? We need a we need some poll we need a polling thing here. Okay, I'm gonna spoil it and say um, it's rules based. Um, and the reason is, I'm just checking here because I it's it's. I f I feel like the modern examples are all machine learning, but um, the answers are. Online payments are a straightforward logical process. False. But <laughs> um, is it possible for a programmer to confidently, confidently program the ex exact steps necessary? Okay, it says it's possible for a programmer to program the exact steps. Okay. So I guess that's why it's worked with PayPal in the 90s. Um, fraud detection. Okay. Uh, Rainy, I'm checking the, the, the actual notes to this presentation because the, the syllabus was developed by, by Google and they gave us various notes and trainings. I had to, like a three month training on this, various like this and the later stages. This is the, this is the super simple um, stage of machine learning, but they gave us notes on all of this stuff. Um, I'll post it in the chat actually so you guys can read the answer to this one because it is, it is kind of interesting. There. My colleague has just posted in the chat. You can kind of see the um uh the explanation if you're interested. I think it's kind of interesting what they've suggested. Uh I think yeah. Fraud detection is also is, is really linked to machine learning now because it's there are so many different vectors of um, attack. But I think the initial initial process could be rules based. Okay, okay. I'm speeding this up because okay, we've done 45 minutes. Um, I'm just hoping my internet doesn't crash. So <laughs> classifying an object in a photo. I think it's going to go for machine learning on this one, but um, it's, uh, yeah, this is, yeah, it's machine learning. So that's basically what Quick Draw was doing. So let's recap this. What we've talked about, this is one of the fundamental sort of dichotomies in machine learning. Of understanding when and what when to use the rules-based approach and when to use machine learning. In practice, you'd use both. Um, but the, the key thing to know is that rules-based um as is based on kind of making a dictionary. 
uh, if you're if you're a computer programmer, you'll be very familiar with the reliance on dictionaries and um, looking up things, and that's what rules-based approaches do. They just simply just there. There's an input dictionary, and then you get an output. Improvements come from algorithms and network. Uh, yeah, so algorithm just a system of equations or functions, which is x. In input x function y and then network I think that's a bit, 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 bit misleading to say network there network is present in both machine learning learns patterns from data improve, improvements may come from additional data I can't even edit this powerpoint I've got to connect that I've got to email Mountain View and tell them they've got to, got to do that typo Anyway, each has its benefits. So true, so true. Idea to implementation. Since you guys are not hearing um, these uh, videos very well, I'm just going to share these in the chat. I'm going to share the video in the chat and kind of like, you can do it in your own time. And then we'll move on to other stuff. Unless you want to hear my crackly audio, in which case, in which case, do tell me, but. Yeah, can you? Okay, so here's the video. Uh, all of these are public videos with uh, Frank, uh, provided generously by uh, Google AI, which is another subset of Google, and which is sponsoring this program and sponsoring this um, us, um, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine Developer Community. Um, so they are eager to promote their video. If you want to watch that, um, you can. Um, let's just kind of, I'll just continue talking at the cost of my voice. <laughs> uh, this is the basic workflow of machine learning. And we've kind of talked about it a little bit. Um, so user provides data. Um, you define your objectives. So that would be like collecting data usually. And it's collect data. <laughs> And then you train and test the model, and then you predict and evaluate. The, the key, the crucial thing here is the is the is the fourth stage, train and test. Constantly be thinking about that dichotomy: train and test, train and test. You have your data, you're testing it again, and you're iteratively improving it. We're going to go through this in like a proper coding script at some point. And again, do tell me what languages you like, because we can do anything here. We have total freedom. It doesn't have to be Python, or it should be probably. Um, prediction and evaluation. We will get onto something called loss, which is a, a way of evaluating. But at the moment, it's sufficient to say that you can simply um, talk about whether it was accurately tagging. Think about continuous or discrete uh, data as well. If it's, if it's discrete, it's like um, you, you're going to have a quite quite much easier evaluation process. If it's continuous, uh, that's more troublesome. For obvious reasons, they're just being like yes or no, um, or not. Got another video. This is a good one. It's a shame we can't really. I'm gonna to have to contact them about this. Um, the post in a second. Oh, I've got another video. They do the same video. Okay. What can machine learning do? Let's skip these videos for now. I'll give you the links to them. They're basically just recapping what I said earlier in the in the presentation about supervised and unsupervised. Okay. So this is this is a we're we're going a little bit deeper into definitions now. Because we're skipping these videos, it's actually going to be shorter. This might only be like an hour and ten minutes, this whole thing. So, <laughs> um, 
let's get let's get to the heart of one of the biggest definitional problems in machine learning, which is artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. You probably heard these terms thrown around endlessly. Artificial intelligence is the most misused term. Yeah, sure, Shay. I'll serve them in the group after afterwards. Oh, we don't we don't have a we should create a group. We should create a, we should create a London School of Hygiene developer community group. We actually have one for the team, but we create a, a big one. Um yeah. Um I'm gonna create a, a machine learning newsletter as part of the like the what what we're funded to do. Create a, a newsletter and like a community of practice. So uh, we'll be sending out regular kind of updates, especially relevant to health technology, machine learning and health. Okay, <clears throat> back to the subject matter. Understanding these overlapping terms. Artificial intelligence, woefully overused, not the Terminator yet. <laughs> Artificial intelligence is essentially just the catch-all term for um, computer processes that which are believed to mimic human mental faculties in some way. So that's an impossibly broad definition, but that's the best we have. Machine learning is a subset of AI, and it's basically just concerned with inference from data. If you want to get even more specific, you could just say, um, it's concerned with uh, tagging is something this that applies even to predictions. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm being a bit, I'm being a bit blasé here in the sense that classification is a, is a specific form of machine learning, but most of machine learning is in some sense just classification. What is this? You're showing some more data. What is it? Stephen replies to financial markets. Is this a bull market? Is this stock going to go up? So, and finally, but you can you can basically settle on a definition: inference, inference from data, and occasionally semi-autonomous inference from data. I like to remember this quote from um, the Jewish philosopher Maimonides, who said that famously said, uh, "Give a man a fish, and he'll eat." for a day, teach a man to fish, and he will eat for a lifetime. It's kind of the same in machine learning. You know, code, code something, write a line of code, your computer will do something, do machine learning, and it will do something forever. It's essentially like bypassing the necessity for all of the work that would be involved in rules if you're rules based you're doing a lot of computer programming and one of the one of the great things that i would say i wouldn't say great because it's going to put me out of work but one of the really interesting things is that machine learning is preying upon the very people who are making it and the coders are the people who are being quite negatively affected by some of the new developments you might have heard of this thing you, you might have know something about something called github it's a huge repository of programming. And they've released something called GitHub Copilot. And it writes, it you write a little bit of code in your in your development environment, and it predicts the rest of it. My gosh, it is so good. I've used it. And I write down like two words and it's like, bam, it's just on the whole script. I'm like, well, I'm gonna be out of the I'm gonna be out of a job in a year. <laughs> Because it's it's just it's fantastically good, and the reason is that we programmers are the most exposed to machine learning because we we've been the ones doing it, and it has all of our stuff. It is it is um, it's 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 preying upon its own parents. <laughs> anyway, okay, moving swiftly on. Um, Shay is saying, could could that also just be just be considered? Oh, wait, yes. What are you talking about, Shay? Do you mean do you mean artificial intelligence or machine learning? I think it's the autonom autonomous aspect, which is the is distinguishes it. Yeah, so there are lots of so what we'll be doing when we do this at a later date, um tagging is it the 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 algorithms you'll become familiar with, ones like um, random forest, it's just a way of handling data, but it's 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 
it's it goes in with the fewest assumptions possible and um if you okay here's a way of thinking about it in an in an, in, in a normal setting a scientific setting you would have if you imagine um a rule and then um an input and then your job is to determine the output i'm if you're if you're a mathematician you have some numbers and people say do multiplication on these numbers and you have your multiplied number you have your uh, new number machine learning consists of when you have the input and the output and you're looking for the rule this is about so if you if you try and visualize it like that so it's very much related to an algorithm an algorithm is as i said like a function x transformed in this way becomes y in machine learning you're not looking for y you don't have you already have y you have x and you have y you're looking for the transformation you're looking for the rules of that transformation i hope that makes sense it's it's a, it's it's kind of like reverse engineering algorithms and so you have to start from the premise of like the, the world's run on algorithms like everything everything's kind of like a function you have to have a very sort of mathematical way of viewing the world and then you say how do i how do i reverse engineer the world so i can see the rules i probably just made things more complex and more mysterious but yeah i hope not but okay now for real mystery and complexity deep learning deep learning uses um neural networks okay i'm trying to remember the the official the official the, the most succinct way of saying this deep learning uses artificial neural networks for non-linear transformations um of data um at increasing levels of, of abstraction if you want to unpack that sentence we can do it all day fortunately on friday there's a session on neural networks but we'll be doing some more we'll do pro programming and we'll finally and we'll, we'll look at how a neural network works imagine a brain artificial neural network they say artificial because a neural network is just is, is our brain right so we say artificial because it's not the human brain if we just said neural network we could be referring to the biological thing in our skull if you imagine it's it's rather than having your your standard function of box x then box then y input function output you actually have nodes and each one of these performs a different transformation so it's having lots of simultaneous transformations and then coming out with um multiple results which you, you can compare and iterate over we're going to go into much more detail on this at a later date but imagine um um, imagine a um that the function i've just described is the linear version and the deep learning is the is the non is the non-linear version it's 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 as complex as it sounds but we will do it we will do it this is i think uh not as helpful as the last slide technology is too broad really techne from the greek um Big data uh, algorithms, all of the all of these three things are essential. I think technology mainly is referring to com computer, um, co computational power, um, in the sense that machine learning requires a lot of computational power in a way that made it inaccessible, uh, even just twenty years ago to do at scale. Now we have thing we have the cloud, and the great innovation of the cloud is that you can rent uh, computing power, you can rent computational power. You can use these things called virtual machines to run your algorithms on someone else's servers. And you can therefore have that computational power to get to run your data through. As we just discussed with deep, deep learning, it's partly concerned with networks and no, sorry, it's intrinsically concerned with networks. 
And as anyone who's done epidemiology, um, spread of infectious disease will know, the um, network analysis, probabilistic network analysis, is an exceptionally computationally arduous, it's, it's NP hard task. Um, if you put this in perspective, this is a famous quote from a man called um, Matthew O. Jackson. He wrote uh, the human, the human network. Um, he's actually a professor of economics at Stanford, but he famously said, "If you have a, if you have a, uh, a, a classroom of thirty students, and each what each student could be connect, could be connected to another student or not connected, and it could be connected to any number of students, including zero, then you have." more combinations in that class uh, than there are atoms in the galaxy. This is a very, I would recommend you read his book. That sounds like, that sounds impossible. Read his book, The Human Network. It explains very succinctly the way in which it's, it's very, very hard to do this. Um, very, uh, of a level of abstraction that we need to do deep learning, we simply lack the computational power short of a quantum computer, which we currently are. Quantum computing is a whole other topic, but it's essentially unlocks whole new levels of computational power related to the fact that uh, you bend the laws of physics, as it were. Uh, so that's what it means by technology. I think computational power, essentially. Big data, you of course need data to train your machine learning models and your algorithms. So this is where the rules base comes in. You never you never really escape rules in the sense that you just you just confine them to this to being algorithms. Uh, the human network. Um, so I'm, I'm answering uh, Rainey's question. I'm just looking at it on my on my bookshelf. For a second. I'll send you a link. I'm going to send a lot of links after this. There's going to, there's going to be a, a, an email after this um, in which I'll send you the, uh, the YouTube things and um, information about this, about this lecture. Rambling lecture, including the, this book, which is by Matthew O. Jackson. Okay, let me just, okay, I got, um, I'm, I'm sure of assistance, so I can't really, uh, too much but um matthew o jackson matt o jackson stanford university okay that should get you to he's got a very very useful um website for all of this stuff and it's very useful for us as epidemiologists uh to understand modeling and um network uh, uh, modeling epidemics on networks he's been very 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 useful to that um to that pursuit before I digress any further, let's get back to what we've been discussing, which is classification. And uh, one method of classification. So if you're going to graph this on, 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 on what you, what, how you can do classification actually is to have your categories. Um, and in this case, you'd have continuous data. Um, you, and if you, if you can graph it across an X, Y, X, Y axis, um, you can actually draw a line between them and you can say, this is lion and this is hyena because it, maybe it's length of snout, I don't know. color. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's a, actually color. No, that couldn't, I don't, I don't think you could do colors, not a continuous variable, but length of snout, eye size. If you imagine that these things can be graphed, then you imagine that a line can be drawn between them. And with that line, we can inform classification. Uh, yeah, Rainy, that's that's right, that book. I think, I can't, I can't, I can't see it, but I can see your link. Um, I'm just trying to uh, get back to the old whole presentation yeah um 
So if you see here, this is this is a kind of workflow. What they're showing is not just like a diagram, not just a random diagram. What they're showing here is um, linking up this this photo with various characteristics. I don't know how they did you. They, they maybe they did use mammal from um, something like nose, mouth, eyes, ears. Uh, it's very it's, it's very difficult to know about seeing the actual explicit um, classification technique. Um, it's but it, it ends up being uh, yes or no. Is it a lion or not? Is it wildlife or not? Is it mammal or not? The important thing you should take away from this is that it's going from a um, for graphing something on these continuous axes and then coming up with um, a Boolean or binary uh, definition, binary choice, which is like lion or not lion, wildlife or not wildlife, mammal or not mammal. So if you go to crowdsource, you'll actually be able to see some lots of these examples in action. Sentiments analysis, image label verification, which is what we did previously, sort of, and smart camera. So we did we did smart camera and we did kind of we did kind of did image label verification. Sentiment evaluation is what I was discussing earlier in terms of hate speech. And they're using emojis here to denote um, the categories. Okay, so any most people on, on here will be kind of familiar with regression analysis, which is by far the most um, common introductory uh, machine learning technique. Um, it is it's essentially it's essentially drawing a line, and then saying whether uh, on what side do uh, some values fall on this line, and then iteratively improving based on a test. So this would be that you're training your model with regression and then you test it and you see did it did it how did it perform. In this sense they use then this one they're using um Google Maps. Presumably because the it's the uh, it's trying to approximate the Root. I'm not sure this is a very useful example actually because it's. Uh, I think the point it's trying to make is that the bus is, uh, of course, doesn't go directly from Hyderabad to Mumbai. It goes by uh, any number of other other routes, like the car. I suppose, I suppose it must go the same route as the car, but um, it's it's guessed. That, that is the it's the most that it's, it's guessed that that's the route. Of course, it's an impossible route. So, is it? You you look at that and say, we have the data from the car. How can we connect connect it with the bus data? I think clustering analysis. So this is another um. Uh, yeah, ask a line of best fit is exactly how we do we do regression analysis. Um, um, so this will be familiar. The clustering analysis will be familiar again to people who are kind of familiar with graph or network analysis, <coughs> where we have various clustering algorithms um, for determining the links between. Um, uh, linkages or similarities between people or some some object. In this case, it's 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 using what we would wouldn't expect. You know, layman's a layman's approach to clustering would be: is this person the neighbor of this person? And indeed, um, k nearest neighbor is how one of the algorithms for this. Uh, but in fact, what it's doing. And in this case, it's kind of visually representing. Um, it's broken down handwriting into various different um, qualities, and then it's linking these together. So it might be that, and this is not like regression, where it's like, is it? 
does it have a space does the two have a kind of like a twirl in it if you know what i mean i suppose for you it'd be like like this in the other way um it's not um going with that it's 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 actually going with it might lack that so is it more similar to this it's it's about similarity not about um graphing um across a, a continuous axis if that makes sense these are all kind of related but what you should take away from this i think is that the clustering analysis involves um fewer rules so this is more about coming in with fewer pretenses so handwriting is notoriously difficult it's now very good um so to the extent that you can now uh, banks now use handwriting um uh extensively for le for legal legal uh legal purposes so clustering in a sense doesn't assume uh with, with a regression you kind of have like stipulate what is on this axis what is on that axis and then can we and then you simply put it on and you you try and uh determine a line of best fit whereas with clustering you're you're in a, in a sense dealing with distance it's it's, it's nicely done this visually and in fact probably the best way to do it is visually because then you can say well this thing is a two so again you need your t you need your you need to evaluate it you need to just you need to split your test and train data but once you've done that you'll be able to evaluate is this a two without saying necessarily any particular characteristic you just said this one is a two and it has this metric of similarity to another thing so that's probably a two without stipulating characteristics semantic similarity so yeah this is kind of like um the very very many different ways in which we can conduct um sentiment analysis and no sentence will be well actually sentences are often similar but um they'll be they'll, minute, they'll be not minutely different and so it doesn't pay to go in with a more rules-based heavy approach which is intrinsically how the uh, regression analysis will work. Regression analysis might have been something like, how long is the sentence? How big are the words? Then you can draw a line of best fit and say, this is hate speech or this isn't. Obviously, that's madness. So if you're dealing with something which is really kind of a slippery, slippery beast, um, you don't want to come in with many assumptions. You, you're dealing with something that's probably high dynamic. You do have some um, data which you can test, but um, it's you don't want to be too reliant on um, uh, rules. That would be the essence of sentiment analysis. So sentiment analysis is, is highly fluid. Diff one word in one context could mean something completely different. So clustering is useful for that. Our uh, sequence prediction. So this is a more, this is, um, this one is interesting. I mean, this, the, the, the app it's using here is also on crowdsource. It's, can it follow your, if you're trying to write out a word, can it follow your finger? Can it, and then can it beat you? Can it beat you to the word? Um, so if you see here, uh, you've got these, I can't, I don't know who's, who's the person who's the machine. Okay, so the machine, I think the, uh, who starts first? Starts simultaneously, it's that quick. Um, it's trying to beat the person to the word. And I've tried this, and, my, and it's it's very hard to beat the machine, unless you've got a nonsense word. And if, it, if it's doing this for a sentence, it will definitely beat you. Okay, so this, this is a more simple algorithm, actually. Because it's it's essentially just guessing this this array or kind of vector um, against against a list that it can quickly narrow down. It's easier than sentiment analysis. Definitely. You can see sequence prediction in action by using glide type handwriting recognition or translation task 
um, all the translation tasks on the crowdsource end. So lots of things to explore. Um, this one is is one of the freakiest. It's kind of like some uh, Van Gogh going on here. Um, can you, when you take two images, it then it then sort of synthesizes them and says, "This is blue. This is blue. Um, this is background. This is background. These are shapes. These are shapes." And it produces this it's kind of synthesis. I mean, it, it's difficult to know what the practical applications of this sort of thing are, honestly. But um, yeah. I guess it's useful for synthesizing voices. It's what I'm trying to prove here. Oops. Um, yeah. So this is it. there are lots of apps on the internet which do this sort of thing. And the, the whoops. Um, the point it's trying to get at is it can make art. It can it can kind of like if you imagine that it can make art, then can it? This is a good analogy of how bots like uh, GPT-3 write language. They take language, they synthesize it, they work out the forms of it, and then they produce something that's appropriate. God knows if it actually works. I mean, if you try GPT-3, which by the way is a, is a very powerful natural language uh, model, um, open source, I think it's open source, um, but anyway, you can check it out. Um, it uses something similar to this. Types of machine learning. Okay. Got some more quizzes. And then I swear, that's the end. <laughs> um, recommending next word in the Android SMS app based on words typed so far. Recommending the next word. What do you guys think it's going to be? I'll give you a clue. Then do this. And no, sorry, it begins with S. Yeah, right, it's sequence prediction. This is why in the very beginning, they, they got good at text messaging very quickly. Remember when only only true OGs remember this, when you had like, you had to text and it was agonizing because you had to press like these buttons. <laughs> you, with your Nokia brick, you had to press buttons. Your only way to do it was, to, was for it to let it guess. That was very simple machine learning back in the day and the reason it was able to do it is because sequence prediction is quite low low computation computational power requirements labeling email as spam or not spam this is hard remember it's binary i should give you a clue just chat Correct classification. If it's binary, you're going to go with classification, okay? Actually, no, maybe regression would actually is this is binary as well. Or Boolean, if you want to be programming programmatic about it. Identifying trends amongst a group of people who have brought, bought a new music release. I don't know this one actually. It's clustering. It's our old friend clustering. I guess because if you visualize it, it's kind of like a network and you kind of see where people are relative to each other. It would be quite hard to do that over regression. Secret sequence prediction doesn't really work. Although you could say he's brought this single and then this single and this single. That makes it highly likely he's going to buy the rest of the album. Style transfer doesn't make any sense. A bot that reads the news in the voices of famous actors. Wow. That's pointless. So you, you will automatically know that it's style transfer. I didn't know it was style transfer. I just guessed that. That would be embarrassing if I got it wrong. But um, yeah. I'm being, I'm being a bit facetious here. Style transfer has lots of useful applications. But uh, it's one of those kind of funky things you can turn into an app very easily. If you want to get rich quick, 
try style transfer we're gonna we're, later we're gonna go through later in the year we're gonna go through many different ways of doing style transfer so you can be frivolous to your heart's content determining workout activity based on phone movement let's see what chat's saying on this uh. Tony workout is hmm. Workout activity based on chat. What are we saying on this? Aggression. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. I would have said clustering actually, because phone movement is geographic, geographical, and I don't think you can do that in easily in classification. Oh, I guess maybe it's like working or not working. Um, let's look at the answer to this. The answer is okay. The goal is to output discrete labels. Okay, so if it's discrete, I'm going to go with classification. I think that's very much up to, that's, that's very disputed, I wouldn't, that's, that's controversial. Identifying famous landmarks in a, in a photo. Okay, I mean this one, or what, what, we're trying to identify something. So... Yeah, I think it's this this could be one of two. But um it could be either clustering or classification. It's clustering is geographic. Um but I think it's classification classification because it's like yes or no, isn't it? It's like is this a fit is this it or not? Is this is this the Eiffel Tower or is it the mini Eiffel Tower in Los in Vegas? <laughs> Um, so identifying, I think, is always going to be discrete. Suggesting spelling corrections. Uh, okay. So sound chat. Oh, clustering. I would say I would say classification because that could have been wrong. It could be right or wrong, couldn't it? It's like it's, it, you, 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 you've only got the, it's, it's dealing with intention, and you could only intend one correct spelling, couldn't you? Melvin, I'm seeing Melvin's post something in chat. Quick Google search, although both techniques have certain similarities, the different lies in the fact that classification uses predefined classes in which objects are assigned, while clustering identifies similarities between objects, yeah, which are groups according to various classes. Common, which is different, yeah. So, like we were saying when we were doing it, it was like clustering goes in with fewer assumptions, whereas classification uses predefined classes, so it uses rules. Which makes me think spelling is done is done with rules. <laughs> oh well. I would I would have definitely have said classification on this one, but maybe there are so many divergent ways of spelling and so many uh, different ways of doing it. But predicting the quality score for an advertisement. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're going to go for aggression on this one. The output of the machine learning system is a continuous numerical score. Yeah, that makes sense actually, because because of, because of the way it's 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 that kind of continuous um, output it makes sense for it to be regression. Oh, it's already given me this one. <laughs> Estimating arrival time based on time of day and traffic, which is regression apparently. Is that what you would have guessed? Estimating arrival time based on time on time of day and traffic. Okay. 
Oh yeah, because it's it's then you can you, you can just do it on x y axis. Okay, so the simplest form would have been regression. Yeah, that's okay. You're right, it's regression. Um, these last two are just giving us the answers help helpfully. They know we're fatigued by this stage. <laughs> Translating between two languages, sequence prediction. Sequence prediction or classification. I mean, languages. Oh man, this is the big debate. Language translation is it is it is it rules based or is it machine learning? The secret of Google Translate is it did not try to do rules. Google Translate is exclusively based, as far as I know. Actually, I do know. At least in the most successful iteration of it, Google Translate didn't try to do rules. It just did uh, inference from large scale translation efforts mainly governments so for those who say that tran google translate has rendered the role of the translator uh obsolete so wrong it's so reliant on that unfortunately it didn't pay anything for it so i mean this is one of the one of the questions one of the ethical questions is that these so much of machine learning is is kind of picking up on what already exists utilizing materials that already exist what happens when you run out of those materials? What happens when you put new material? How do you generate it? And how do you generate it ethically in a way that compensates those who actually made it? It's a whole other discussion. Guys, we're at the end. We've survived. Questions. Review. What is machine learning? I think we've kind of decided that machine learning is a, is is um, inference from data, semi-autonomous inference from data. It's inferring um, uh, it's inferring rules and then applying those rules and then iteratively improve, improving them. I shouldn't have said rules because now we're now we're calling them ML versus ML versus rule based uh, uh, dyad um, ML versus so rules based as we discussed is the original approach to artificial intelligence, which is simply to write down every possible uh, counterfactual and create a sort of decision tree of if they've chosen this then this and then this and then. So it's really working out the causality. ML says nothing about causality. It's all correlation. That's the, I think this is ML versus rule basis is just correlation versus causation. I think that's the simplest way to, um, simplest analogy. But of course we do use both. We have to assume this. We, we, we have to still use rules and we, we use those for our algorithms. Ideas implementation. We haven't done that much implementation in this in this tutorial or lecture. But we've talked a little bit about how we can use um, some of the ideas for image classification, sentence completion and text messages, identifying landmarks, etc. And you'll find all about this on the CrowdSource app if you want to go and look at it. AI versus ML versus deep learning. Oh man, this is the, this is the one we spent ages on. AI mimicking human mental faculties. ML, as we just said, inference from data, specifically inference from in, 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 inference from data. Deep learning concerned with the mimicry. So AI is mimicry generically. ML is mimicry from data. Then iterative improvement. Deep uh, deep learning is specifically the mimicry of uh, neural networks as a as a way of reasoning about data. Five types of ML: classification, clustering, regression, sequence prediction, star transform. We can classification. Um, generally it's it's uh discrete it deals with um yes or no is it or isn't it 
and it's uh, um, um, and it's overwhelmingly concerned. This is overwhelmingly the concern of of uh, of machine learning at the moment. Clustering. <coughs> Fewer assumptions. Um, more about more about gauging. Sorry, that's my dog. Uh, more about gauging um, uh, different characteristics characteristics of objects in relation to one another. Regression. I think you just essentially essentially have to ask yourself: Can you graph this when it comes to regression? Can you draw a line of best fit usefully? Um, even over um, three dimensions, can you usefully can you usefully do this? Can you draw this line of uh, best fit? Sequence prediction. Um, there's not much to say about this except that it's kind of um, looking at your data, existing data set to infer certain probabilities. And then style transfer, the craziest of all, using basically all of the previous, um, going in the almost no um, prior assumptions or rules. If you can draw that kind of what we saw, the kind of uh, Van Gogh turtle, then you realize there are very limited rules. This is about transplanting some characteristics um, onto another thing. Uh, with very little recourse to um, why we're doing it or what we're doing. We'll look into some algorithms of how to do this um, in the future, but that's definitely the end of the list, star transfer, because it's not entirely um, practicable. And that's the end. So, I mean, it's been an hour and a first year of me talking, I can't remember the last time I spoke for an hour and a, and a half. I needed, I needed a drink <laughs> of water. Um, okay, so any questions or anything? Uh, thanks, Attica. Um, great wave of Kanagawa. Yeah, that's that's cool. My art history knowledge is lacking, so I'm re I'm relying on my machine learning to get me through art history. <laughs> okay. Um, now you just see me. Okay, guys. Um, I'm going to try and follow up on this, but this is the kind of like the the beginning. The beginning of this machine learning journey. They're talking about doing some in person in Google um, in London. I don't live in London, so it's a bit awkward. I know most of you don't either. So, I mean, there's there's possibility of doing some of these in person. Some Google AI specialists are going to come and speak to us, um, talk about very specific things. But the thing I'm most excited about is getting and doing this in practice and oh god have we lost video okay well um i'm gonna i'm gonna call it a day here feel free to email me or go to the group and kind of um there'll be a follow-up email with a post event survey please write in how good Greg was. Um, do tell me if you enjoyed this or not, and what we can do differently. And I think this was the most boring one because we weren't really doing any exercises, and you guys weren't were not doing anything except kind of like just watching. Um, but in the future, we're going to be doing lots of like lots of practicals. Okay, good stuff, guys. Um, that's kind of it. Uh...